Welcome, everyone. This is Denny Miller to our new podcast, which is called Indy 500 Yesteryear. And today with Speedway Insiders, Paul Page, Bob Gates, and Denny Miller. And this podcast is dedicated to the memory of our dear friend, Robin Miller, no relation. And um, it's been a couple of years in coming. Robin and I go back to our freshman year at Ball State. We lived across the dorm at Howie Call, and um, we each claimed we were the uh, knew more about the Indy 500 than the other, and it was just a great friendship that evolved. And then in 2019, Bob, you were there that day. I, was, I live yes. in Redondo Beach, California now, so it's kind of hard to get to Robin Miller's weekly luncheons, but I came that day, and we'd been talking about starting what was known as Miller Time, which would be a nostalgic look at past Indy 500s with some contemporary stuff as well, a kind of a weekly show. And um, we thought, well, we'll just wait until the new decade came. And in uh, uh, May of 2020, COVID came too, and we didn't do it. And then Robin's health was getting worse and uh, it didn't happen. And then with the help of Paul Page and Bob Gates, it's, uh, become a reality. We dedicate it to you, Robin. And uh, we have a um, email called speedwayinsiders at gmail.com. And if you want to email your best Robin Miller stories, uh, we'll be reading them on the air. This may very well be a weekly show. We're certainly going to do it during the month of May. And um, with this, we want to start and introduce the, the two other people on this podcast, Paul Page and Bob Gates. I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, for those who do not know you, and I can't imagine people not knowing you at all, uh, <laughs> tell us about your illustrious career in both radio at the Speedway and television, and then talk a little bit about your, about your new book. Well, we got to start by taking the word illustrious out of there. I, <laughs> I, I just had a great time. I mean, I'm, I'm a race fan, and they were actually paying me to go to races. So <laughs> that's my career. And in fact, when I was, before I even got that job, when I was um, working at a radio station and trying to race a Formula Ford, uh, we would sleep on the hood of our cars outside the registration gate, like seven o'clock in the morning so we could get in. And then we had to pay. So now my career was going places for free. I, I had it made. Uh, I think that I'll be able to, uh, to talk a little bit about those things that I never could talk about on, on uh, broadcast radio or television or ABC or ESPN or NBC. So I may have a few stories for you. And uh, yeah, the book's out there. It's um, only at Barnes and Noble right now. And it's also available from Auto Books, Arrow Books, uh, there in Burbank, California. Uh, Amazon sold out of them. But uh, Hey, there's another one coming, I think. We'll put in a plug for Tina at Arrow Books. She's a sweetheart yeah, and everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we both had a chance to do book signings there. And uh, uh, she always has plenty of they're they're the best. Krispy Kreme donuts and everything to make it a, <laughs> they're a good people. important morning. Uh, uh, do you have a copy of the book that you can show? I'd have to go get it. No, oh, I don't That's have all right. It. All it just right, says... and, uh, Mr. Gates, uh, Bob, tell us yes. about... Uh, uh, your illustrious writing career and everything. I'm a fan of who you've written about as well. Well, a uh, career might be a stretch, but uh, I've certainly enjoyed my involvement in racing just uh, from a passionate fan as a kid to be able uh, to take part in things like we're doing today. It's just, uh, I'm like Paul. Uh, I haven't reached the, uh, the magnitude that, that he has but just being able to be involved in racing, uh, just just been a blessing in itself. Um, I've written for several years, 30 years now for publications like Open Wheel Magazine, National Speed Sport News and, and other publications and been able to do several books. Uh, one on uh, Jim Hurtabees, uh, another on Bill Bukovic and the Bukovic family. Uh, both of those are out of print uh, they can be found if somebody's desperate for one uh, on the internet, doing an internet search or kind of expensive, which I don't get any of that income, yeah. uh, sadly. 
<laughs> but uh, they, they're out there. I would caution you if you're interested in, in one of those two books to look around before you buy. You can find some <laughs> at a reasonable price. Well, and in May time, they had that very good uh, two-day uh, 500 nostalgia yes. show out at Plainfield. There's That's a, a great source to be able to get things. Uh, yeah, those, absolutely. For those who uh, don't know me, I wrote the book on Eddie Sachs, the Clown Prince of Racing, and I jokingly say it would be the most sensational book you've ever read with all the <laughs> zany stories and things. Uh, and then my newest one is called the Eddie Rickenbacker Era, which is his ownership of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway from 1928 to 1945, and just a very fascinating era. Uh, I'm now working on the sequel to that. It's going to be called the Tony Hallman era from 1946 to 1977. Paul, what's your next uh, book you're working on? Um, a a follow-up, uh, uh, more of a pictorial, where we'll put in some beautiful photographs, and then I'll have a story to tell with each of those photographs. You know, you're talking about Rickenbacker. You just reminded me. Um, you ever hear the Rickenbacker guitar? It's like, in essence, the first really excellent electric guitar ever built. And I just found out the day before yesterday, it was named Rickenbacker after Eddie Rickenbacker by the guy who designed and built it because he was a cousin. So mm -hmm. I thought, I'll be wow, yeah. <laughs> another I've connection. Never, I'd never heard that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. It's amazing where your information can come from. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a museum in Columbus, Ohio called Mott's Military Museum. And they have a section dedicated to uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, and they actually have a replica of his boyhood home. He grew up in Columbus, yeah. and a one of the true Rickenbacker automobiles as well. So I've been on them to see if they can let me test drive it and everything. And they <laughs> haven't haven't offered that yet. Bob, what's going to be next book wise for you? Well, I don't really have any books in the uh, in the making yet. Um, I get a lot of requests for people that from people would like me to do a book, but finding a, a printer, finding someone interested in publishing a book is kind of a challenge mm -hmm. right now. I got to also mention the book on Troy Rutman um, mm -hmm. that I did. That was my most recent book, California Gold. And uh, it is still in print and uh, you can get it at several different locations. Pit Stop Books is the publisher for that. I like to send people to Toddy Rutman, uh, you can always locate her on Facebook, mm -hmm. Troy's daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. She sells the book. She can autograph them and send a photograph of her and her dad. So it's a little better deal maybe for the customer. But there's And don't lot. forget, you also did the uh, redo of uh, Gentlemen Start Your Engines with uh, Wilbur Shaw. Yes, that's right. Is, yeah, Wilbur Shaw's classic also, book and yeah. uh, updated with his son, uh, Bill Shaw. So, uh, and the good news for Toddy, she's been wanting to be able to drive her dad's race car at Indy on, yes. uh, and I guess she's got the okay to do it now. So, uh, uh, that's, I'm glad for her on that. Um, uh, so do you have a favorite of your, your books, uh, Bob? Is there one person? Well, I, one? I think probably, probably the Vukovic book because he was my hero as, you know, as a kid. And uh, growing up, there was just always uh, something uh, mysterious about Vukovic. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a guy to be very open with the media, very open with the press. So it, um, you know, left a lot of mystery uh, surrounding him. And just the way he came on the scene at Indianapolis, uh, just like a blazing comet, if you will just burned brightly for a time and then, then was gone. And a period of very, very short periods of time, four or five years, just dominated the Indianapolis 500 and, and set records for laps led and those types of things, percentage of laps led that still stand today. Oh, yeah. All, uh, all these years later. So probably my favorite book, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, they're all good. They're all all heroes. Well, it's that these. way with me with this with the Sachs book. Just I, maybe it's because it's the first, and uh, I just 
the friendships that were made doing the uh, that type of thing have been long lasting. And, yes. Uh, and the zaniness of Eddie Sachs, you can tell <laughs> story after story after story and you never get tired of the right. telling yeah. the story and everything. Sure. So uh, we had a race yesterday. And, yes, we did. Uh, the, yes. They call it the Augusta of IndyCar and everything. It's certainly a gorgeous facility they, they built down there. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's gorgeous, and it was gorgeous on television. Oh, and yes. what, what especially um, is interesting to me about that is that the track was originally built for motorcycle racing only. And it was, an, it was a private course. They have a beautiful museum, again, at the time, primarily dedicated to motorcycles, but they've integrated a lot of other into that right now. But they, the course is just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And um, what a great day for a race, beautiful weather. Only I guess they had a thunderstorm pass through just before mm. the, they were getting in the cars, and, but they got it done anyway. And I think it's, it's beginning to tell us um, the young kids are taking over again. You know, yes. you got a got a number of young zealots that uh, are brave beyond belief and skillful beyond even that. And, uh, and we saw that yesterday with uh, Pato Award being the uh, the winner and um, and Rhinus VK, who was just gorgeous the entire day. I mean, he didn't miss a, a foot. Uh, there are several of those in there. Rhinus would be one. Uh, Colton Herta would be one. Um, and to some degree, even even uh, Rossi, that they were driving their pants off, but the the flags and the pit stops didn't come exactly right for them. So, uh, but it, I think it tells us that Indy, uh, if you're making out your chart now, you better start memorizing some of those brand new names too. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. And I, my thought was too, boy, they have to absolutely keep Award and VK and Polo in the series and not lose them to F1. I, I hope Herta will stay. I think he's probably going to go but maybe well i think i think he and, and his his dad would like to see that happen and we all know that michael wants a team so um i think it's probably inevitable but as we all know formula one can be very short lived for a lot of guys they um you only keep that skill so long and so that's no doubt i think wayne on colton and 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 that whole group that wants to do formula one is you know, can we get over there? Do we want to take them over if we don't have a viable car? Uh, you know, there's a lot of decisions there, but uh, I, I think you're going to see him there eventually. But I think what I want him to do is win his championship and his Indianapolis 500 first, because I think he can do mm -hmm. both of those. Yeah. Yeah. Like well, right. Jacques Villeneuve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I was very impressed with those young guys yesterday. Um I think the the top three were all under 25 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you mentioned Colton Herta. Uh, he should have been up there in the front, uh, caught the caught the flags wrong, uh, the pit stops wrong. And but well, man, and he had he, he had a qualifying that didn't work either. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. on his hot lap when I forget who it was spun and yeah. negated his lap. So uh, yeah, you know. But that's that's the that's the way it works. It's racing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he was certainly coming through the field. Yeah. Had he, he, he started on the pole, this might have been bye-bye everyone. Yeah, yeah. Could have been. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, also good to see VK do so well for Ed Carpenter Racing. Yeah. Uh, Ed Carpenter Racing, they've been very good, of course, on the ovals through the years, but not so much the road courses. And so VK, uh, you know, with Ed Carpenter Racing doing good on the on the road courses. That's, that's very good to see. Yeah. Do you see, uh, with Pato awards, win uh, the collar getting a little tighter around Felix Rosenquist's neck? Yeah, yeah probably. I mean, it, it's, and Rosenquist it's, is a good race car. Driver, he's a great right? race yeah. driver. Yeah. And, and that's the thing about it. All of these, all of these kids that have come along kids. I'm not, well, I, I have the right to call them, <laughs> but, um, uh, they're, they're all just incredible race drivers. And so it's not only how good they are, but how good a team they get, which has always been the story as well. And uh, watching them move and change, I mean, the rumors are already going about what's going to happen next year, especially uh, with, uh, with the McLaren. And that just, you know, it's, it's what makes it fun. Yes, ab absolutely. And you are talk you about hearing, 
that Rossi to McLaren rumor from your... I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Oh, <laughs> I've heard it. Uh, uh, I must have been started out on a coast. Oh, I know. <laughs> that that yeah. happens here. I was just going to, to mention, Rossi, you mentioned uh, uh, Pato Award and, and uh, Rosenquist and the pressure he might, Rosenquist might be feeling. I think maybe the same thing's going on with uh, Rossi and, and Herta. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, through the through the season so far in last season, uh, Herta's uh, certainly outperformed Rossi. Now, it's not always been Rossi's problem, uh, but he's certainly, right. that youngster has certainly outperformed the more experienced racer, and that puts a lot of pressure on Rossi. Yeah, it does. And, uh, yeah, I've heard the rumor, too. So. And particularly <laughs> with uh, – Rojan running as strong as he is doing, uh, just with his newness and everything, I think that adds pressure too uh, for that. But a change of scenery for Rossi, I think he's tremendous. Yeah. You know, he yes, could, he is. He could easily. easily be a three or four time winner. And, easily, easy. Uh, he's yeah. that good. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. a true asset for IndyCar race. Uh, so many yeah. of these are now. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, you know, you talk about Pelo and VK and Award. It kind of reminds me of the Bobby, well, the Allens or Mario John Cott era. That era, yeah, sure. And then you had Castro Nevis and Dixon, and now yeah. this becomes the new. This is the next generation. Ready right. and uh, everything. They're they're uh, entertaining to see, and then there's some. Talented drivers that doesn't have even a ride. That uh, uh, Oliver Askew, I think, is a very good race yeah. car driver. I think J.R. Hildebrand deserves a ride. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. And uh, obviously, everyone thinks uh, Kyle Kirkwood is going to be a superstar. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's exciting for IndyCar. And um, and I think with the thumbprint of Roger Penske over uh, everything. Oh, by the way, we want to put a shout out to – Roger Penske, we wanted to give him the opportunity to be the first one to appear on this today. His schedule wouldn't allow that, but just in honor of him and respect for what he's done for racing and now on the speedway, he would have been our guest of guests, if you would, today on that. So, Roger, we miss you, but know that you're always invited anytime to come on and um, be our guest and share. You know, you're one, of the, one of the things I really like about Roger, and I don't think most people get it. They, they see as Roger as the billionaire businessman. You know, he's, he's always straight on top of everything. He makes everything as beautiful as he can, uh, like he is doing with the Speedway. Everything he runs is just absolutely top notch. Notch, but there, there are other, other sides to Roger. And Bob, you can probably relate that one day at, at the lunch, the, our regular racers lunch, uh, here came Roger bouncing across the, uh, the yeah. 16th street and pulled up and joined us for it. So he's, right. he's right. also pretty down to earth. <laughs> yeah, he is very humble, very down to earth. And he's just such a personable individual. And, and what strikes me is, and he's been renowned for this, the way he can remember people's names mm -hmm. and relate to him. Now, I haven't been around Roger nearly as much as Paul has, and it probably been a couple of years at least since I'd seen Roger. And when Paul was referring to him coming across the street to our racer's lunch, he rolled up, walked up to me and said, hi, Bob, how are you doing? Yeah. Uh, called me by name. And it, it just, it, that impresses people. And he makes a, a, you know, he makes a big effort to do that type of thing, to have those personal relationships with people, whether you're at the top of uh, uh, whatever uh, business you're involved in or sports you're involved in, or if you're just one of the guys. Yeah. So uh, I, that really I, makes I just... me respect him. What I really love is that one image that is crystal in my mind of Roger Penske sitting in the middle of a parking lot, eating a cheeseburger with the rest of us. Yeah. And Robin, <laughs> right. Robin, of course, was all over that. Right, right. We got some good, pretty good pictures from that day of Robin. Yes, we did. Um, we were yeah. Hampson for one time. <laughs> so what did we learn from uh, Alabama that may translate to the Indy 500? Expect the unexpected. Right, exactly. 
And I, 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 my take out, there's going to be several teams that are uh, very strong. Uh, and uh, unless Dis Dixon just checks away and runs away with it. Well, he hasn't shown the ability to do that so far, uh -huh. has he? No. The, One, the open, the, do we want to talk a little bit about what your thought of the open test last week and the closeness of speeds with all the, the cars? What, what was your take of that, Bob? Of, well, I was just going to mention, test. going back to the Alabama race, really what's striking at this point, Chevy has won all four of the races uh, to this point. Now, whether that translates to speed in Indianapolis, I'm not sure, but Chevy is definitely on their game this year. At the same time, Honda is not an organization that will take a backseat to anyone. Mm -hmm. So it might be interesting to see when they get to Indy, uh, just how all that works out. I think that you'll find in the scheme of things that Honda worries about Indianapolis more than they do anything else. I think they yes. think they, they get more uh, out of Indianapolis and a win there. Um, but they seem so close together, the, 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 the engines right now. They're really tough. Right, right. They are. What came, my, my thing that jumped out on me was that the open desk was how potentially competitive Jimmy Johnson might very well be yeah. in a Ganassi He's getting it, isn't he? in a, in a 500 mile race. Yes. But what's your take on his chances to possibly win Indy as a rookie? Oh, I, 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 I don't That's want an to answer, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I know. You know, we still haven't seen him really, really jump up though. He had a great run at, uh, at Barber um we don't know what little speedway tricks that he has in his head from having run that on his way to his championships at the speedway um so i i, I certainly wouldn't count him out i wouldn't right. count him out at all right well he, he's with a great team of course yeah. so a lot look, of at, it look at tk tony canon and uh top in the charts uh oh, don't forget elio mm -hmm. go for five yeah. baby right <laughs> <laughs> drive for five <laughs> well, Jimmy, I think if Jimmy runs the entire 500 miles, he'll finish strong. He'll be there. Yeah. Um, whether well, he'll let me be ask this. Do you think he'll run better than like Kurt Busch did at Indy? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I do. Too. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, that I was, do. that was really a one off for Kurt and then, and, and Johnson's had the time in the car. He so what's your, what's the your race take of how well Grosjean adapted to end oh wow <laughs> yeah. um i i think what he has done right from the the fire and formula one to this day is just he's been amazing over here and i think he enjoys it over here i guess he just moved to miami and um uh he's he's certainly showed himself to be w one of those other factors that is absolutely there mm -hmm. i mean you you can now it used to be as as you know denny that you could take the starting field and you could pick four guys and one of those would win. At least I, I did. Mm -hmm. You can't do that anymore. You can't uh -huh. even begin to do that anymore. They're all so close and they're all so good. And of course, the thing I've always loved about Indy is it's 300 miles essentially further than any other race we go. And so that 300 miles is a, is a total unknown. And what happens there? And, and remember, it's more often than not, the guy leading at 190 is not leading at the checkered flag. That's true. So, uh, you know, who knows? That's why we go. Or as Mr. Holman <laughs> said, I, I remember Mr. Holman being asked at one time, uh, uh, Mr. Holman, who do you think we're, is, is going to win this race? And he said, well, that's why we run it. <laughs> we, and that was a typical Tony Holman kind of comment. Right, right. I'll put another comment out about Ricardo Yunkos and how well Colin Ayotte uh, ran. That kid he really real talent. Of course, he, if he finishes number two in F2, uh, you're pretty good. He, he showed us a lot, I thought. Uh, goes that getting into an IndyCar from F2 or even from Formula One, it's an entirely different beast. It requires a lot more, uh, a lot more muscle and uh, you re you really have to throw the thing around, and you got got to know where you can put it and not put it. And he was pretty good at that. And he was quick at Indy in the uh, open yep. pass too. So right. uh, uh, that was impressive with a uh, I don't know if we can say under budget, but certainly a one car team. 
Yeah. And uh, very impressive on that. So who do you see uh, as the 33rd entry? Is that going to be Stefan Wilson and uh, the Elton Julian combination? Uh, like he ran Ben Henley a couple of years ago, or, or will this be something else? Paul might have something. I, I think it's going to be Wilson. I understood, though, uh, that it was going to be through Foyt's team. Mm-hmm. An association, someone else with an association and with Foyt. And but again, Paul he, might be able to elaborate on that. Well, I, I only in that you know how it goes. There's there's just enough or not enough cars on, until we get down on, on top of qualifying, right. and suddenly uh, cars get rolled out of all kinds of places <laughs> yes. in the garage area, and suddenly we've got thirty five guys trying to right. make it. So. Right. Um, it, it, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not the greatest idea in my thinking to look at the practice times, um, from the last test, cause it's just that it's a test. And that track is in nowhere near the kind of shape it will be in on, uh, on race day. Uh, so you have to factor all of that stuff in. And that, again, that's what makes the whole thing so cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the unknown, the unexpected. Well, again, this is to dedicate this to Robin Miller, and uh, I know I've heard this story before from Paul about his Formula Ford days and Robin Miller. Would you tell our great audience here about it? Robin Miller, Formula Ford story. Well, uh, first I got to say, Robin and I were great friends. Um, <clears throat> there was even some pictures of us back in the early 70s that neither one of us, I think, wanted to make the public. But he had very, very long hair, and I was trying to catch up with him. <clears throat> um, he, when I went to ABC, he would cream me every week with something he would write. You know, and I thought, oh, man, okay. But I understand that's that's his business too. Except when he went to work for NBC, he'd been there like for five races and he came up to me and said, Paul, I apologize for everything I ever said about you. I see what you were up against. <laughs> the, the Formula Ford, Robin and I both had Formula Fords. And we're talking the early 70s now, um, 71, 72. Um, and I had a, I had a beautiful uh, Eldon, Mark 10 C, which was a great race car. And I, I bought it new It was shipped in from England. So I was, I was really excited about it. And Robin would check with his friends at a similar lunch that, that we have now, Bob, um, every week to, to say, Hey, how, how page do. And they'd all say, Oh, he was, he was the best ever. He was magnificent. Just killed them all. You know, <laughs> and I, that went on for a full year. And then Robin got so frustrated with it that he paid the money to get the, the scoring sheets for every one of those races and found out, no, I was a mid packer. <laughs> I, I never won a race, but it would sure bug Robin for a long time. I thought that was great. And Bob, you, I can't thank you now. I know soon after Robin died, I was kind of on you from out here on the West coast to kind of keep the Robin Miller racers lunch going. Uh, and thank you for being the kind of the spearhead of that. But how did that all get started? And what really funny initial story you have on Robin is, is racer's lunch. <laughs> well, uh, the, the racer's lunch goes back years and years and, and uh, really goes back to some of the times that uh, Robin and the Bettenhausen's, you know, uh, all the Bettenhausen's and people like Bubby Jones and, and um, those type of guys were just to get together for lunch on a routine basis. You know, they'd be working all meet up for lunch. But Robin wanted to do something to uh, keep the memory of some of these guys, you know, alive uh, and pull the guys together and give them the chance to reminisce and, and tell stories and that type of thing. Uh, guys that had retired, you know, from racing or maybe were all at the end of their careers. So that's really was the uh, impetus behind behind Othe, the entire thing, and it just grew uh, grew from there. Um, you mentioned uh, me continuing on there towards the end. Robin kind of depended on me to 
Well, I would pick up Bill Vukovic Jr. every week, for instance, and get him to the luncheon. And as uh, Robin got weaker uh, and dealt more with the cancer he was dealing with, it kind of fell to me to help him take care of some of those routine things. So I just picked up the mantle after that, and uh, we're, we're continuing on with it and uh, have a large turnout, 15 to 20 people every every Friday. It's been a few weeks since Paul's been able to be there, uh, but we have people that come and go. Maybe you don't see them for a month, and then they're there. And often we get a mystery guest, like when Willie T just dropped in, yeah. came out of nowhere and sat right. there. We get those too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. And, and then Robin used to bring all these old pictures, of, you know, the, the oh. great sprint cars, and, and we'd sit there and pass them around. And all of us are looking in the background to see who's standing <laughs> there, you know. There's Jimmy. I didn't know Jimmy was at that race. It, it, it's just oh, a wonderful thing. The time I came, he brought Bob Nedelecki there. And yeah, 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 he would. So yeah. it was beyond just the uh, people in racing and everything. Yeah. Well, thanks for keeping that alive, uh, Bob. And again, uh, you listeners, uh, like Robin's Lunch, we want to keep a lot of racing stories alive and trivia and, and things. We want to talk to contemporary as well. But we love our stories. And we want to have you share what you want to hear. And if you got stories to tell and send it to speedway insiders at gmail.com that's speedway insiders at gmail.com. And we'll, we'll read some of them and everything. And we'll in the future have guests as well. Uh, this year they're making a big deal over Elio's drive for five. And, uh, during the, month of May, we're going to be looking at uh, the four four-time winners and the races that they happen to win, starting with uh, Supertex, A.J. Foyt. He became the first four-time winner and winning in 61, 64, 67, and 77. And Paul, in a little bit, that becomes a very special number to you and perhaps 1977 was the was the best of all years for a historic ad Indy. Um, but I was thinking last night when three time winners were almost thought of as impossible to get yeah, to. You right. know, you had your oh, yeah. Maury Rose, Wilbur Shaw, and Louis Meyer. And will there ever be another three time winner? And yeah. now it's uh, will there ever be a, a five time winner? But uh, looking at uh, Foyt and, and in particular doing the book on Eddie Sachs, Eddie Sachs and A.J. Foyt were intertwined a lot. Um, the uh, 1961 race was, and they made a big deal about that, is the uh, golden anniversary. And that year they had a Ford Thunderbird painted gold as the pace car, and the winner gets the pace car. And Eddie Sachs was going around telling Tony Holman everything, drive the car slow, and he would take a, a handkerchief and wipe off fingerprints because he did not want his car to be driven at a high speed and everything. And Sachs was always good about that comicalness. It was a, a tragic month in a way. Uh, uh, the year before Jim Herbie's almost ran, uh, the 150 mile an hour lap and, yeah. and everyone knew that Tony Bettenhausen was the odds on favorite in the Autolite special to, to win the pool in 1961. And that afternoon, the day before the first day of time trials, they, they put it in what they called the barn early. And, uh, Paul Russo was struggling in the, uh, car that Roger Ward won the 59 race driving the Sterling car and they talked Bettenhausen into uh, the test driving it. Uh, what do you remember, Bob, about uh, Bettenhausen's accident? Because you're, you're around uh, Gary and Merle a lot. Did they ever talk much about that to you? Or? Yeah, and Merle in particular talked a lot about it. He was still in high school and uh, when the accident happened, just on a personal note, uh, the principal called Merle and his sister, Sue, 
to his office and actually broke the news to Merle and Sue there in the principal's office. And um, they were just within hours of coming back here to Indianapolis. Uh, that was on a Friday, the day before poll day. So they were on the verge of, uh, as soon as they got out of school, the family, the rest of the family was going to head to Indianapolis, meet their dad there. So uh, very, very tragic situation for them and for the family. If you can imagine, you know, kids uh, still, in, still in school and getting that type of, uh, uh, of announcement and having to deal with that. Somehow I think almost that magicalness of breaking 150 even seemed even more of a milestone than the 200 mile an hour lap. Um, maybe it was a different. Well, they, because they, part of it is they, they nibbled at it for quite some time. And the whole idea of a lap in 60 seconds. Yeah. Now we look at the lap times now and now that's <laughs> nothing. But boy, at that time, getting that lap, um, I, I do have to admit that I had occasion uh, to take Bryant Gumble out on the track. He was in town for the NCAA championships and I, I got a, a pretty quick little car. And so I got permission. I was going to take him around the track. And I realized on the third lap, we actually went faster than 150 <laughs> miles an hour. And I had a passenger. <laughs> so cool. I, I just remember, Bob, you can maybe help me. If I remember, first of all, that was essentially a main straightaway accident and it was a mechanical yes. failure. A, a bolt yes. fell out of the steering, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tony had uh, practiced a little bit that morning and he was right on the verge of the 150 mile per hour lap in practice. Uh, many thought he would get the pole and break the 150 mile per hour uh, barrier, barrier, the magical 150 mile per hour barrier, as they called it. And But he ran a few laps that morning, parked it, and his buddy, Paul Russo, came to him. Uh, Russo was driving what was the 1959 winning car of Roger Ward's, but having trouble getting it up to speed. Uh, he asked uh, Tony, his buddy Tony, if he would uh, test it for him. And uh, Tony wanted to, but he went to his car owner, Lindsey Hopkins, and Hopkins did not want him to do that. Uh, you know, test hopping cars was just, was just too dangerous. And... Uh, so anyway, uh, Tony did it regardless. And coming down the main stretch, the nut had came loose on the bolt that hold the steering arm to the steering mechanism. The bolt fell out when he, when he hit the brakes and that sent him tumbling down the front straightaway up on the, up on the wall actually, and then wrapped up into the fence almost like a cocoon. Mm -hmm. At that point, the car caught fire. Now he uh, knocked eight or ten of those uh, posts down as it tumbled yeah. along. And most people thought that was Paul Russo in the car. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So. Uh, but that that's how it happened. Um, and then Sachs wins the pull the next day. That becomes his second consecutive yeah. pull winning deal. And uh, uh, was probably favored to win uh, the 61 race. Uh, later in the race, uh, AJ Floyd in the Bo Seal fast car, they traded the lead back and forth and back and forth. And um, when it looked like uh, everyone had made their third pit stop, something happened. Paul, do you remember what happened uh, to Floyd on that? Um, no, I, I, it, he didn't get uh, a wheel nut on, right? I, no, I actually, the fuel uh, didn't. He's uh, got a short fill. Short fill. And uh, yes. then when he went out, uh, his car was so much lighter, yeah. and he was able to pull away. I, uh, I just, I always get that confused with Eddie and the uh, the warning strip on the tire showing, and he thought it was something different in that year too. I mean, those. Um, you were you were talking about AJ and thing I think is really unique with his four wins was that he did them in Roadster and a rear engine car. He bridged that gap. And it was a 10 year separation from his third to his fourth win. And then of course, his fourth win was significant to me because it was my first time to anchor the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network. Um, 
And it was a great battle throughout the race between John Cock and, uh, and AJ. And then a crank finally went in John Cock's uh, engine. And I remember John Cock climbing out of the car and going over and, and jumping into the creek to cool off. So, yeah. But then AJ wins it. And at that time, the victory circle was directly in front of the master control tower. And so it's straight down five stories below where I am at that moment. And AJ pull, pulls in and he climbs out of the car. I remember he had those black leather driving gloves and he pulled them off and he threw them. And I swore AJ threw those at me. I mean, he was recognizing <laughs> me. And then I realized right below me is where all the 500 Festival Queen and the Princesses is where I'm. And I, I figured it out. When you met mentioning Queens, here, here's a great story. Whoops. <laughs> that Johnny Parsons Jr. told me at lunch on Friday, as a matter of fact, uh, about AJ. Uh, AJ, uh, when uh, Johnny Parsons was in school, their homecoming uh, event was coming up, and they had, of course, a homecoming queen and, and that type of thing. And since Johnny was involved in racing, someone had the idea, hey, Johnny, why don't you call AJ Foyt and see if he'll come to our homecoming? Now, this was 1961. A.J. had just won the Indianapolis 500 and was really making a name for himself. And Johnny, a young, young, kind of timid guy, and he said, there's no way. I'm not calling A.J. Do you think I'm crazy? I'm not calling A.J. Foy. So Johnny's sister said, well, I'll call him. And she did. And believe it or not, A.J. agreed to come to their homecoming at Cecina High School <laughs> he drove the gold Thunderbird convertible, took the queen, the, the homecoming queen around the track, you know, around the football field in that Thunderbird, uh, <laughs> Thunderbird convertible. <laughs> That's AJ. Well, you can imagine that, you know, the Indianapolis 500 winner uh, driving the uh, high school homecoming queen or, around during their, yeah. their homecoming event. Things have certainly changed, haven't they? Well, Sachs had that race won after Foyt did come into pit. And uh, with three laps to go, he noticed the white breaker strip showing up on his uh, tire. And then he comes in. It really annoyed big time Clint Bronner, his chief mechanic. Uh, and a lot of people said Eddie didn't had virtually no mechanical sense. And Not had no. he did like Wilbur Shaw in uh, 37 when he beat Hepburn just slowed down a second a lap he would easily had won that I think they even took out the uh, uh, I've heard stories where Foyt or someone went and tested the last three laps that the tire didn't blow uh, there's some theory that Eddie was to retire if he won and he just really couldn't not want to quit driving there's lots of theories but I don't believe that he wanted to win Indy but Paul, the Foyt of or the Sachs of the fifties before he married Nancy and had a little, mm -hmm. uh, more of the women chaser of the white yeah. front and everything. I don't see him pulling in. Do you? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, I, I don't, don't either. You know, the I Allentown didn't. Flash. I mean, yeah. he <laughs> he had a good single life going for him. Yes, in the white what front. I mean, now you're talking real speedway history. Go with yes. that. And, and and by the way, we'll be talking the white front. And that for you viewers that want to talk about that as well yeah. in in future times. It's it's Six, still there, but it's not white anymore. Yeah. No, <laughs> kind of a Six, gray. <laughs> Sixty four. AJ wins his second. Uh, that was the day that Saxon Dave McDonald got killed. That was a horrible day. Uh, Jimmy Clark and Bobby Marsh, but no one would have beat them that day, but they dropped out. I don't think Foyt would have beaten Parnelli had Parnelli had the pit fire. Uh, I think the Agajanian car is a little stronger. What do you think, Bob, on that? It, it would definitely have been a, a, a fight to the end, if you will. Then a toss-up who might have won. Um, at that stage of the race, just before Parnelli pitted and went out with that pit fire, he seemed to have the handle on AJ, mm -hmm. but, you know, as the race goes on, as Paul mentioned, that's 500 miles. And there's so many things that you, that can change and happen uh, during that time. It'd been interesting. I would oh, that, to that had the makings of a battle type of uh, thing between those two. 
Yeah. 67, no way he would have won had Parnelli and the turbine not broke down. Uh, and uh, he was lucky on the last turn, on the last lap, to win his third Indy 500. Paul, you remember uh, that accident that happened out of turn four? <clears throat> yeah, it, um, it happened right in front of A.J., and there was nothing but confusion coming off of turn four and all the way down toward the pit entrance. <clears throat> and I remember the ABC call of it. Um, you, you know, you watched it later, uh, a week later, I think it was at that time. And um, Jim McKay is, you know, where is AJ? Where is Foyt? You know, and there he is. <laughs> I also thought it was cool that, wasn't cool, but it was interesting that you hear tires skidding and screaming. Well, the tire didn't really do that in those days. It was a sound effect that they added in. And I, I did I did some work with a, a, a guy uh, who did uh, championship race films for a long time. And they were, I was in the studio and I was doing some voiceover work for him and they had a crash in the thing. And they said, oh, wait a minute, we don't have an effect for that. So this is, this is up like at Gomillion Sound or something in Hollywood. And so the, the two sound engineers looked at one another they went out in the alley, grabbed a trash can, and threw it up against the wall a couple of times and recorded that. And that was <laughs> well, and that leads us to 77 and your first year at, at Indy, Paul. And I, to me, uh, as I said earlier, I don't think there's probably more historic Indy than 1977 for several reasons. Um, tell us what you recall which probably still seems like yesterday to you, yeah, uh, how 77 came about and you being the anchor to call the most historic race ever. Well, I, I had the extremely good fortune of being mentored by Sid Collins, uh, and he had been training me for that position for three years. I had been at the track first as a radio news reporter and then as a member of the network. I've been at the track essentially since 1970. Uh, as some form of a reporter. Um, I worked one point for a radio station called WIFE and the news director, Bill Nanella, we all remember Bill, uh, as always present in, at the Speedway. Um, Bill let me take his pace car, which was a convertible. And I pulled it and parked, I had a garage area sticker. So I parked it in the garage area and I left and I went and I got all my stuff. When I came back, I realized you don't leave a car with a parking sticker in it that is a convertible because it was gone <laughs> and boy did I catch the daylights for that one but yeah um and, and of course Sid passed away um essentially on this date uh second of March and uh not essentially actually and the next day was the radio network breakfast, annual breakfast to bring all of the team together and start talking about what we were going to do. So, you know, overnight, I'm suddenly doing something I hadn't intended to do. Sid and I had talked about, um, actually, he would start the 77 race and then I would finish it. There'd be a mid-race handoff. So now I'm, I, I don't have my mentor and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty down. And I had, what, three weeks to make sure that we had a good Indy 500. I, I like to think we did a, a good job of it, but I was, uh, I was scared to death the whole, the whole race going on. Because, I, you know, first time, uh, first, first actual play-by-play -play call of a race was the Indy 500 for me. Wow. So <laughs> I had a lot to learn. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> tell, tell them about that story you've told before about... Uh your producer coming by right before oh, you going on. Right. And, that and... guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jack Murrow was his name, and uh, he was the booth producer for us. And he had a long and, uh, and storied history himself as being the producer and how he would keep calm in the booth. And he was the guy that, you know, covered all the, the bases and plugged all the holes for you in the booth. And so he'd been doing that for a long time. And now the clock is counting down, you know, we're getting down. We're in the last 10 seconds before we take the air. And he leans over to me and he shakes my hand and he says, Paul, there are 3 million people out there. Do not screw this up. <laughs> 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 what <Well, laughs> <I have> encouragement. 
<laughs> what what was the storyline of the 1977 race, Paul? Well, uh, it, it was uh, focused on on the John Cock Foyt uh, battle. Um, you know, that's the days when the the cars were built in their own shops, and the cars are vastly similar. Uh, I had actually uh, worked on uh, one of. Uh, Actually, Wallen Dahlenbeck's teammate to Gordy at the time, one of his cars, because when I, I, I didn't have a real job in radio, I, I had this job, but I had a lot of free time. So I went down to George Pignati's shop and they let me work on my Formula Ford there. And in return, I'd, you know, I'd push Clecos through holes and everything and help string up the car. So uh, I obviously had had a preference in that Gordy would win it, but uh, we all knew the whole month that that's the way that was going to come out. Those two were going to be head to head. And of course you had the fact that Janet Guthrie being the first oh, yeah. female. To, uh, I hear okay. rumors that Hillary Swank is going to be starring in a movie. Really? About, uh, about Janet's well, that'd be cool. first run. Yeah. Uh, well, Janet, um, yeah, that was her first year. And of course, that was a controversial year because of that. Um, but and everybody was like, the, the drivers don't want her here and all that. And that was her public posture. It was certainly Bobby Unzer's public yeah. posture. But when she needed a driver's suit, he had one that fit her. And, you know, everybody's quietly, you know, Janet, come over here, help you. And um, I remember after the qualifying for the race, Janet said, you, we're going to have a little party over at the apartment. You want to come over? I said, absolutely. And I was, you know, I was at the time, I was, I looked pretty good. I had a nice tie and coat on everything. I walked in this party and they cut my tie off. <laughs> <laughs> and Janet is going to be brought into the uh, uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame this year, uh, inducted, as will I. Yes. Um, so we're going in together. You know, and we're actually going to, to honor six different inductees because there hasn't been a proper time to uh to honor them with the COVID and everything so there'll be six inductees uh come the uh what is it uh, bob the thursday yeah the thursday night yes. before the race right yeah and congratulations again on that paul oh thank you thank everything you. uh that very, very and well, well deserved. deserved and well deserved there's there's a handful of people what i call beyond iconic sid collins <laughs> One Tom Carnegie, Jim Neighbors. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. And you too. You know, you you're humble enough, but yeah, you know, from yeah. from the Gateses and the Millers, uh, you it, it's that, you know, yeah. and all you've done to make indie indie and everything. It, it certainly was an honor when I got the call. I'm like, oh no, this is terrific. What do, what do you do now? Do you think Foyt would have beat John Cock had John Cock lasted? I don't think so. No, I, I, I think you could go either way. Um, you think you might have had another Mears John Cock finish with mm -hmm. those two, and probably the third place car would be the one you'd be watching. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was Sneva, wasn't it? Sneva, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that's the third main storyline, being the first person to 200. qualify at 200 mile an yeah. hour. Yeah, that was a year. That was uh, really a I, year. Uh, uh, you, I don't think... You could have written a script no. more perfect for you to have your first year than that and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, AJ wins 61, 64, 67, and 77. You talk about Elio's drive for five. Foyt ran from then until 1992. Yeah. He was there at 93 and had probably Robbie Gordon not crashed. Foyt would have qualified for that race, yeah. but you he didn't was a rookie. hear that. He was a rookie in 58, right. but remember he got caught up in that turn three accident on the first lap when Ed uh, lost it. So he was, uh, he got a baptism by fire at the speedway, but he, everybody already knew he was an awesome. awesome but no, no one really talked about Foyt's drive for five all those years. No, later. no. It, uh, it, so this is, uh, and I heard Foyt say the other day that, you know, you talk about winning twice in a roadster and twice in a rear mm -hmm. engine car. He also said he never got to drive a Penske. But a little <laughs> well, I guess dig, that would be true, wouldn't a it? A little, little dig <laughs> yeah. into uh, you got to win with a Penske car or something like really, that. Really, what's the, the other amazing thing about that career? You know, in 1958, he probably qualified at, I don't know, 130 miles per hour. 
Yeah. And then like uh, when he retired, he was going almost a hundred miles an hour faster yeah. Yeah. than what he was in his rookie year. Just amazing. And, and even more amazing, uh, the foresight of Bronner in a way, Clint Bronner, the higher AJ Foyt coming off the success of the iconic Jimmy Bryan, who was three time national champion. Yeah. Now, Foyt did not run all that well for uh, Dean Van Lines the two years that he ran there, but nevertheless, he was their pick. Mm-hmm. And they saw something at, a, at an early time for that. You know, that, that rookie year for him was also significant for the radio network point of view, and that, that was Lou Palmer's first year on the radio network, uh, who later succeeded me in the booth. And uh, Lou was assigned to turn three. And I don't think he had a real grasp at the time. He's told me this, that he didn't really know what to expect. And the first thing that he sees as he gets the call handed off to him is the Lason going sideways and everybody going everywhere else. So uh, <laughs> that was a baptism by fire for Lou as well. Yeah. <laughs> I tell in the, the Sachs book, uh, uh, there was not if Elysian and Rathman crashed, but when, when? <laughs> Elysian and that. And well, they Bob, had, you, and, you remember part of that was they had that very weird, um, they wanted to start from the pits and mm-hmm. they had a, yes. they were going to make it all fancy and all that did was get everybody confused. And so that was kind of a, eh, it's probably not going to work at all. Yeah. That uh, was the last year they did that too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the, uh, well, the year before when Elmer George runs into, uh, I should know who he ran into before, but yeah, help you. he, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, I don't recall who he ran into. Yeah. But oh, Eddie he Russo. <laughs> Eddie Russo. Mm-hmm. Yes, Both were rookies right. that day. Uh, but there was supposedly a huge amount of money on who would lead that first lap. And also, Elysian was in all sorts of uh, uh, financial scrapes and gambling debts owed and everything. In fact, by the way, for people who like Ed Elysian, uh, send us your Ed Elysian stories and we'll, we'll talk about it. I, I feel he's just a highly interesting and unique character in Speedway history yeah. and everything and, and other people like that, but that's part of what's neat about this at speedway insiders at gmail.com. We'd love to hear about your Ed Elysian stories as well. Uh, but Bob Weiss said, it's not, if it's going to happen, and it's not going to happen in the first turn, it's going to happen in the third turn because they will have it, enough speed going down yeah. there. And they just, uh, it did. and Charlie Brockman told me he was leaving a party and he and Pat O'Connor were walking out and, uh, Charlie said, Pat, be careful. And he said, I, I sure am. I'm going to stay far enough away from, uh, from those two idiots. That didn't work though, did it? That took and, his life. And a couple days before Pat O'Connor, the very handsome Pat O'Connor appears on the cover of sports illustrated. Uh, yes. and also I was told, uh, by his wife's wife that Tony Holman already had said that he could be the replacement for Wilbur Shaw and Pat wanted to win Indy one time. And Tony said, well, you don't have to have that. And it all ended that way too. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, we had, uh, an interesting week in, in Alabama. Mm-hmm. We have a four time winner going for five, five. uh, we are going to have probably potentially one of the most highly competitive this year's Indy 500. So stay tuned, everyone on this. We wanted to talk I'll end kind of briefly. Uh, yesterday, May 1st was the death of, uh, Mike Nazarick at, uh, Langhorn, uh, six weeks before that, the 1954 rookie of the year, Larry Crockett gets killed at Langhorn. He was from Columbus, Indiana. And it uh, turned out to be a pretty tragic month, didn't it, Mm -hmm. Uh, Bob, with uh, uh, just marquee names not surviving. And it it ties in with your book. (laughs) It was a very tragic month, very tragic year uh, in in auto racing. You mentioned Nazarick and 
Larry Crockett, um, of course, uh, Vukovic in the 195 uh, died in that multi-car crash. Uh, just prior to the 500, I believe it was May 26, Alberto Oscari uh, died mm -hmm. and uh, testing a car at Monza. And what was interesting, it just struck me with Masaryk when he died at Langhorn, he did not intend to drive that day. Mm -hmm. He'd had the flu and he went just to watch the race. Um, his new car, his new sprint car was there. And I think the owner talked him talked him into to racing that day. Uh, he ended up taking the lead. And then a couple of laps after he took the lead, he, he got involved in the accident and died in the accident. And I thought it was ironic, similar situation with Oscari, uh, because he went to this test at Monza to watch the car and the driver that he was going to share uh, co-driving duties with and some of the uh, endurance races coming up that season. Had no intention of driving, uh, but he decided he'd get in and give the car, a, you know, a car a test. Got in actually, had his uh, dress clothes on, had his tie, uh, just put a helmet on and, and uh, <clears throat> took off and then died in that accident, in an accident as well. And so he had survived plunging into the Monaco yeah. <laughs> Bay <laughs> Harbor. Uh, right. A week right. or so prior to that. So, so I, I thought though it was ironic that two guys died uh, really in, in uh, situations they initially had no plans of being in, involved in. And, and of course, Oscari, he was uh, very well known at that time, the first consecutive world champion, uh, the first world champion for Ferrari. Uh, but I think he's very well known, especially to uh, American fans and Indy 500 fans, and that he he did compete in mm -hmm. the Indianapolis 500 in 1952. And his so, dad was an outstanding Antonio Ascari as well, who also got killed uh, yeah, in a race car. Yeah. Uh, well, those are the kind of stories we will be telling. I'm sure we'll be telling lots of Bill Vukovic stories. Uh, we didn't get a chance to tell about how Jerry Hoyt wins the poll. <laughs> Maybe you'll tell that uh, next, week. next week, Bob. Okay. As, as we do that, uh, Paul would love to hear you tell kind of what made each year special. Maybe 1978 and year two, and how it changed compared to year one. Uh, I, I got stories, <laughs> and uh, that's what's going to make this neat. Anything that our viewers want. Again, speedwayinsiders at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. We're going to make it casual like this. Again, it's dedicated to Robin Miller. Any uh, stories you want to share about Robin Miller that we, I guess we can say almost anything on this. <laughs> no, no, no. He's got lightning bolts. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we, don't, we don't want that. But uh, um, so, and we're going to have, different uh guest personalities on i was talking to eddie Sachs today and he said he'll appear sometime in the month of may if if, if we're dumb enough to have him on no it would welcome <laughs> eddie on the show he's quite a interesting person himself so uh, any final comments you might have paul we're gonna have the greatest indianapolis 500 ever it's something I say every year, and it's always true. So uh, I think <laughs> over so. that. And Bob, anything else that you might well, want to add? Well, I agree. Uh, as Paul said, I've been going to the 500 as a kid since 1961. Point one, that was my first 500. And, and every year, just like Paul said, you hear that this is going to be the greatest one yet. And invariably, it turns out to be so. Something always pops up that's newsworthy, dramatic, exciting. It's what makes the Indianapolis Indian. 500, the Indianapolis 500, greatest spectacle in racing. Well, from Paul Page and Bob Gates, I'm Denny Miller, and we're wishing you all Godspeed, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>